Welcome to the Inside Carolina podcast. I am your host, Tommy Ashley. I am joined by Joey Powell. We've got a special guest with us tonight. We've done the 40 clubs uh, for the last year or so. Quarantine got us into the 40 clubs, Joey and I, talking to former guys um, on all Carolina sports. This one's going to be a little different. We're going to call this kicking with the 40 club or kicking it in the 40 club. Aha. Uh, Oh, yeah, you like that, don't you? I've got a, a special guest. If you're on YouTube, you see him and see his banner behind him, Mr. Dan Orner. Dan, appreciate you joining us, my man. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. And I thought when we first talked about the 40 Club, I just turned 40 this year. So I was like, man, this is what it took to get to get in. You know? <laughs> yeah, really. You, uh, yeah, that's right. We waited a long time. We called him on his birthday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I just turned 50 and, uh, my wife got a piece of mail out of the mailbox today when I got home from work and it was my AARP card. <laughs> I said, it's, it's Dan, clearly- the, the, 50, the 50 club is actually Tommy <laughs> going to eat dinner at 4 PM at the KW. <laughs> <laughs> Very accurate, but we still keep it real on the 50 club. Nah. Yeah. Johnny t-shirts, our sponsor, of course, take a look at them, support them. Johnny t-shirt.com. They take care of us. Rate us, review us, subscribe, subscribe, uh, it makes a difference to us. Y'all got me choked up talking about being 50. It kind of messes me up. Anyway, let's get serious. Dan, uh, you're at Carolina from 2001-ish to 2004, played the 2002-2003 seasons, but I want to start earlier than that. Tell me a little bit about um, how a kid from New York grows up to be a college kicker and what it took for you to get to that point before you went to your first school, which was Michigan State. Sure, sure. No, um, so I grew up just north of New York City, about probably about 30 miles north of New York City, and really grew up playing pretty much all sports. Um, I was pretty much just a, a kind of an all sport rat. Um, played, you know, 150 baseball games over the summer, um, traveled around all around the country playing soccer. You know, my parents were kind of uh, pretty strict where, you know, you weren't allowed to come home after school, you had to play a sport. Um, I had an older brother that was a track star. So I actually used to have to run track. I hated it, but I would have to go run indoor track in the winter and we go down to New York city and I would just get the doors blown off me by, uh, the kids that were, uh, actually good at sprinting. So, um, so, but, um, you know, I, I think most of the kids in, in our area was soccer was pretty heavy. Baseball was pretty heavy. Um, uh, my grandfather played for the German national team. Um, they were immigrants to the United States. So I thought that I would go play pro soccer and, um, you know, I actually, you know, played, played soccer up until my eighth grade year, ninth grade year, played baseball. Um, and really, um, again, on Friday nights, my dad was like, you can't, you can't, you can't come home and hang out on Friday night. So I, he would make me be the ball boy for the football team. So I would go, um, and be the ball boy for the football team. And at halftime, I would go out dig my heel on the ground, put a football and had a strong leg. So I would just stroke 35 yarders at, at halftime. And the special teams coach was a friend of the family. He's like, you know, you can use a block. And, and by the way, you're going to try out for the football team next year as an eighth grader. And I was like, sure, whatever. I, you know, barely watched on TV, watched the college games, you know, like most New Yorkers, you watch the Cowboys um, and you watch Notre Dame football. Um, so, uh, um, the next year as an eighth grader, I tried out for the varsity team. I ended up beating out a senior. Um, uh, and then I, it was great as a, as a middle schooler, I was leaving school early going to, uh, to, who, to practice football and soccer. And, and, uh, so it, it was a, it was a great experience for someone like myself that just thought, like, I would look out the window every single day in class and be like, I can't wait to go play baseball or soccer or, or football. So, um, Basically, by the time, time I came a senior, I had a couple small offers to pay baseball. I was I was kind of a really good leadoff, kind of uh, center fielder, um, kind of slap hitter, get on base, kind of you know, kind of scrap around, kind of. Um, but really, at the end of the day, um, I had some small soccer offers. Um, I had seven or eight offers to go as full rides, and and you know, my family was you know pretty much a blue collar family. My mom was a nurse. Uh, my stepmom was a teacher. My dad at the time owned a, a ski shop and it wasn't snowing. So uh, I definitely needed a, a scholarship. Um, and, and really, I wanted to go to Penn State. It was only a couple hours from my house. Joe Paterno pretty much put me on a golf cart 
with my dad and was like, you know, after I kicked a camp was like, you know, you're our guy. And at that time, you know, Joe Pa was pretty much, you know, mm-hmm. he was, he was, he was the guy close to home. So, um, um, and, and kind of once, you know, Joe Paterno offered at the time, uh, you know, Nick Saban was at Michigan state and he had just, you know, taken over that job. Well, um, uh, basically long story short, I was getting ready to commit to Penn state and Joe Paterno. I call up on the day of my commitment and they tell me, listen, we've been, we've over offered and, uh, we'd like for you to come as a gray shirt. And at the time I just really didn't trust that and know a lot about it. Um, and then, this young progressive coach, Nick Saban was at Michigan state and, um, you know, he came to the house and, and, you know, he's, he's obviously good at what he does. And, um, the next weekend, my parents and I were on a plane to Michigan state. I think it was the only sunny day that I ever experienced in the state of Michigan. Um, and at that time they basically had the number two recruiting class. Basically it was Alabama at Michigan state. Um, they had the number two recruiting class, number one recruiting class, um, and I went in there and, and basically that first year we went and played Florida in the equivalent of the uh, probably the fourth place bowl. Um, so it was a, it was an awesome experience. And then obviously he left. Um, and I think a lot of guys um, like myself wished they got on that plane to LSU and would have had a national championship ring. But, <laughs> you, know, you know, really for me, I was I was kind of sick of the cold. Um, the coaches, the coaches really had changed a ton. Um and the only two teams in the ACC that really recruited me was um, was uh, Chapel Hill and then Georgia Tech. Uh, and I can remember one of the first recruiting letters I got was like a, a um, it was a, a program from from Chapel Hill and Dre Bly was on the back. And, you know, Coach Brown and all those guys, you know, at the time, I think he was just transitioning to Texas. Um, and uh, so I ended up calling up the coaches and. Um, Coach Bunning was uh, had just taken the job. Um, at that time, I was pretty beat up from football, um, just from the whole transfer process. And I think my dad and myself just decided, you know what, let's go watch some bowl games. We went down to the Citrus Bowl to watch some games. We ended up jumping like a 15-foot fence um, on the backside of the Citrus Bowl because the practice fields were good. We made a little highlight tape. I sent it to Coach Bunning the next day. He was like, you know, we want you in Chapel Hill. Um, so I got on a plane, um, and I just remember get you know, at the time that, um, um, coach Huxtable picked me up from the airport and I remember getting, coming from Michigan, getting off the airport and seeing grass, it was green and you could see the grass. <laughs> and I just kept saying to coach Hawks, I was like, you can see the grass. He's like, yeah, yeah, we, we see the grass all the time. I was like, no, you don't understand. Like it's green. This is nice. I can wear a t-shirt right now. I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was awesome. And, you know, went to. I joke around. It was like the only one of the only Duke basketball games I ever got a chance to go to as a student. So uh, after that, I remember going back to Michigan State. Was like, I'd, I'd be crazy not to be. This is this is blue heaven. So, um, but interestingly enough, you know, most of the, my family grew up as the you know the the Irish Catholics or the Italian Catholics. Everybody kind of grew up Duke basketball fans. So I remember calling my dad and being like, "Listen, this is where I'm going." And everybody just said, we're throwing out all the Duke stuff. Like we had, we had stuff in the house. Um, I don't even know if I told people about this, but we had stuff in the house. I'm sure I had something in my bedroom that said like do basketball or something like that. And my dad was like, simple, we're going around the house and we just threw, it, threw everything out. It was so, <laughs> um, but from then on, it was, uh, it was just an awesome experience, a completely different experience than one I went through at, at Michigan State, Michigan State was really a football factory um, when Coach Saban was there. And, and um, you know, uh, I really, really loved my time with Coach Bunning. Um, you know, that first year with with Pep and Willie Parker, obviously those guys did an awesome job. And we kicked Auburn's butt in the Peach Bowl. But, um, you know, I, it was exactly what I needed in order to flourish as an athlete. And, um, you know, school was a little tougher, but uh, – um, you know, I, I, I would definitely say that all my dreams came true at, at Chapel Hill, definitely. And, and without going there, I would not be where I am today, without a doubt. 
That's a pretty awesome story. I mean, Joey, this is going to be an easy one, man. We just yeah, wind him up is a, and, is and totally let him a, roll. This, uh, is, this is what? This is, a, this is a chip shot. Is that what we say in, in kicker parlance? <laughs> chip shot. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, I could listen all day to the stories. Let, let me ask a, a question about Michigan State. Obviously, Nick Saban then was still Nick Saban, but not the Nick Saban um, that we've seen over the last two decades since. What was he like as a coach back then? I think, I think Nick Saban then, he believed he would be where he is now. So the kind of the attention to detail that he expected from us at that point, he had already made his mind up that he was going to be one of the greatest coaches ever lived. And the way that he approached us, the way that he pushed us in practice, um, you know, I always joke around, um, Josh McDaniel was the one of the equipment managers. And when you think about some of the guys that were um, that were equipment managers are now D coordinators and quarterback coaches. I mean, um, you know, uh, I, I've been blessed to be around some some cool coaches. And um, um, one of the other equipment guys, a guy named Matt House, he's a D coordinator in the NFL now. And um, some of these guys we were slinging our dirty bags at. <laughs> and uh and, and asking us to get bagels and stuff like that but Saban was tough man you know it, he was a, he was a guy that that expected attention to detail fortunately for me at that time um he was kind of grooming me to be his next great kicker and the guy that was ahead of me was was an awesome uh mentor that got drafted in the fifth round so I was kind of one of those guys that was I would say like untouchable like if coaches yelled at me he would he would definitely silence them and be like, I'll talk to him. But if you do, the door's over there. Like he was that intense. And if you had a great day in practice and you were walking down the hallway and your buddy had a bad day in practice, he would say hello to you. He would completely ignore the other guys. <laughs> wow. I mean, they didn't even exist. So um, it, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was very intense every single day. The pressure was, was immense every you know Sunday morning. You dreaded going to that, that Monday morning meeting when you were in your positional room and your picture would be next to, you know, great college player, all American, or they had, they had, they would put your picture next to a recruiting mistake. It was that um, intense. And as an 18 year old, you're going, man, this guy was just in my living room last week and this week I'm a recruiting mistake. So um, but I think the thing that he made us feel like was practice was so intense that when we went to the games, we were literally walking, we would be, you know, chasing the chariot, um, out of the tunnel at Michigan state, just going, how bad are we going to beat these guys? Mm. Um, you know, the locker room was really quiet. He would go around and shake everybody's hand and, and he just kind of gave you that look that like, we're the baddest dudes on the planet. And when we come out of this locker room, there's nobody in the world that's going to ha- – he just gave you that feeling. I mean, you just felt – like, I'm 5'8". After he would talk to you, I felt like I was 6'2". So, mm-hmm. uh, he just had that gift and just demanded uh, – you know, when he walked in the room, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, he just demanded excellence at everything you did. So, I, I actually really enjoyed my time with him. I, I flourished in those kind of – uh, environments with high pressure. So, um, for me, um, it was, it was naturally a good fit. So I want to, there's a couple different directions I want to go here, but I want to make sure before we get too deep, I do want to share with, with with our listeners and our viewers kind of what you've gotten yourself into is, is now you actually coach kickers. And I want to, I want to bring this out now because I think it's going to help us couch a lot of the rest of this conversation we have with you, but I mean, you literally just coached both of the both of the the footmen for the Super Bowl winning Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You've worked with all sorts of Army All Americans. You've worked with a ton of Groza finalists. Um, I mean, just guys on scholarship in every single division. That's impressive. So knowing that's what you do now, I want to kind of go back a little bit, kind of where you and Tommy just were. When you left Michigan State. You talked about being beaten up. I think those are your words you mentioned earlier. You're like, you know, I was kind of beat up. Things obviously changed for you in Chapel Hill, or at least 
uh, were, you know, were enough to keep you still engaged. When I hear a guy say he was beaten up, it doesn't sound like you would have continued on the trajectory of not only kicking, but definitely not to the level of success that you're doing now. What changed in Chapel Hill that made you kind of find that fire back or get back the desire that you had of wanting to, you know, chase the carriage out of the tunnel and, and wanting to, yeah. to go walk through a wall? You know, I think, I think, um, I think at the time when the new coaching staff came into to Michigan State, I, I think a lot of us were, were a little burnt out on football. And, um, you know, of the 22 guys that I went into, I would say only like seven states. So everybody kind of jumped ship. And, um, you know, for me, I, I was really starting to question if I wanted to, just because it wasn't fun anymore. And it's, it's easy to kind of get burnt out when you're doing it 24-7. Um, and I was just kind of at the time, I, I think I was uh, maybe a little bit immature at the time, um, just in terms of where my career was going. You know, I had, you know, really only kicked a couple balls and, and didn't really feel like I contributed enough at Michigan State. So, um, you know, for me, I, actually, I ended up going back to New York for the summer and I had a kid brother. I ended up going to watch one of the soccer games. And um, for whatever reason, um going to watch one of his peewee soccer games really I feel like changed my life um mm. just because I was burnt at the time and I looked down the field and my brother's running down the sideline the ball is on the other side of the field he's having the time of his flipping life and that's for me sports was like it's it that was my life I mean 24 7 so I left there and I think I went and did a workout my little brother's like maybe he's like seven at the time and he goes, hey, can I come with you? And I had to run 110s. It was hot. I was dreading it. So I'm running 110s. And I think just the way that he just kept running with me and was looking at me, I was like, Shh, man, this is my, I got to, I, I have to do this. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, I think for me, it was, um, it really changed my perspective that um, I was fortunate enough to have another opportunity. And I just knew that I was going to take advantage of it. And I just kind of said like, one, um, I got to start running for the sake of running. I got to enjoy running from drill to drill, even if I am a kicker and stuff like that. And at the time when, um, when I got to Carolina, you know, Coach Connors and his his crew of 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 hitmen on the uh, on the strength staff came in, and and at that time it was almost a joke that you didn't want to be like a lot of guys would at, at Michigan State were like, man, I love to be a kicker at, at Chapel Hill. You know, they were working us out so hard at practice, pushing gators. We were testing all the strength and conditioning things. People would look over and be like, we don't we don't want to be a specialist because <laughs> and we were kind of joking around at the time. You know, our traps were like up here and and uh, a couple of the guys like Matt Baker and, and even and even Jacobs would always say like, man, our kickers are jacked. So uh, <laughs> it was just it was it was a great group of guys. They embraced the. Uh, um, you know, a, a slick hair kid from New York. And, um, you know, uh, fortunately for Coach Bunning, he just, man, he just, uh, he really believed in me. And I think when I was at the tail end of my career um, at Michigan State, I just didn't have that feeling of like, um, not just a father figure, but in terms of just someone who really, truly believed in me. And Coach Bunning just, uh, you know, he gave me every opportunity to succeed. And, um, you know, he kind of, uh, you know, obviously threw me into the fire out the gate, but, um, it, it, at the time it was exactly what I needed. I needed someone, I didn't need someone cursing at me and, and grabbing me by the face mask and telling me that they're going to ship me back to New York because I missed a kick. I needed someone to be like, you're my guy. And, and, um, I'm going to teach you how to be great again. And, and that's what coach Bunning did. So, um, you know, uh, I'm definitely forever grateful for him and, um even some of the the the, the tough nosed guys that were there like coach tranquil and and coach huxtable i don't i think those guys only knew how to yell but you know they never really they didn't they didn't feel the need to curse at us and stuff like that which i think we responded well to let's so uh, i love that you're kind of going this direction i want you to, to stay with that a little bit help me understand when did you realize that not only was chapel hill good for you because it was a change of scenery and because some of the people were different but was there a moment where you felt like this feels like home, this feels better, this feels like an, a place that is fostering the person that I want to be? 
Yeah, I think I think um, I think in multiple directions, not only from you know how they were how we were treated. I would say even as specialists, we were treated as part of the team. And I think in other places, you're sometimes treated as a second class citizen um, because you're kickers and punters and stuff like that. We did everything everybody else did. Now, obviously, if we were running stadium steps and, and some of the offensive linemen always chose us to to piggyback up the steps. So it was lighter. But, <laughs> um, you know, you know, we just ha- I still talk to probably two or three of the coaches that that were coaches. Then I talked to Coach Powell who is our special teams coach. And I tell guys all the time, uh, coach Powell's at Pitt now. I tell guys all the time, like, if you have an opportunity to play for this guy, you should, he's a player's coach. He's going to help you flourish. He's not going to screw you up. He's going to, he's going to hold you to the things you do great. And I think that was the, that was a, that was the experience that I remember most about Carolina is that there wasn't a coach that, uh, that just was out to bury guys and ruin their uh, morale. I mean, even coach Hawks, who was probably the toughest coach that we had coach Huxtable, Dave Huxtable at the time, who was the, you know, linebackers coach. We, you know, at the time we had, you know, Quincy Monk, David Thornton, we had some, we had some linebackers. They would bring us over and hit with the linebackers during practice. And it would be at times, of course, when like, we didn't know it wasn't going to happen. We didn't have a mouthpiece. So we'd run to the bathroom and get like <laughs> wads of paper towels and put them on our teeth. <laughs> and uh, it was, it, I, I just, I, as easy as it, as it can say, I just started having fun again. And even though that these guys were laying us out and we probably got three or four concussions getting hit by the linebackers during practice, we just, we loved it. We had, we had fun. And, and uh, I think that's part of it. And it's, it, there's got to be a, a humility side to it. So you talk about having fun, uh, like I'm picturing, you know, the the scene from Rudy where he's just scout team and it getting laid out by DEs and getting right back up. And so I'm sitting here thinking about uh, the most fun moment, at least for a lot of fans, when they hear the name Dan Orner, you know where I'm going with this. Come on, man. You took, I, I booked the guy and you stole my question. I was, go ahead, okay. I, no, no, you that's go right. ahead. I, I'm I, messing I, with I feel, you. Go ahead. <laughs> You know where I'm going, Dan, the inflatable helmet destruction at Duke. Like that's in, in, in Tar Heel fan lore. You're a, you're an absolute deity just from that simple. Not, not that you won the game, I think, but that you actually destroyed their giant inflatable, you know, state fair esque helmet. What do you remember about that? And what could you share about what may or may not have been going through your head? And then I'll let, I'll let Tommy ask uh, his version of the question afterwards. <laughs> I, I, um, you know, it's funny. I think leading up to that week, I remember sitting, gosh, I was, I was sitting with Landon Mariani at the time and we were sitting in the meeting rooms. He was, you know, he was a signal caller at the time. And I think for whatever reason, a flash of the helmet came up. And I think I said something to him, like, I'd love to kick a game winner and trash that thing. And <laughs> so uh, you talked about it beforehand. I love that. I th- I think it definitely came up. It definitely had came up. And and you know, <laughs> unfortunately, um, unfortunately that comes up for me. It's probably my worst game, worst best game of my life. Um, going into the game, I think I was like eleven for eleven. You know, pregame, I'm hitting sixty yard field goals both directions. You know, nodding at the Duke fans, and then I'm sure, <laughs> of course. I picked the one day to, to forget how to take my steps as a kicker. I ended up taking my steps wrong and not knowing it, just caught up in the moment. You know, I missed a 53-yarder in the end zone. I'd never missed a 50-yarder short in my life. And it landed in the end zone. It was one of the ones where, like, everybody at Duke kind of thought I would make it. It lands in the end zone. Everybody's like, ooh. <laughs> and, then I, and, then, right. and then I missed another <laughs> short one. And then It's like you missed a lag putt or something. And everybody just kind of right, exactly. like real concerned – like yeah 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 i got I, you i it, w- it was one of those situations where i think the ref looked at me he was like we're gonna have to put that up on the board and uh just because the way i was stroking the ball heading into that and i was kind of known as a long ball kicker um even as a smaller guy but um you know i ended up missing another short one and then we came down of course i missed the only extra point in my life like you know, <laughs> I, I probably could in that game of course and and luckily darren durant and, and sam aiken you know, tear, tear ass down the field. And, and here I am getting, getting ready. And I remember um, John Lafferty at the time was the holder and he could just kind of looked at me and was like, 
whatever you do, don't miss right. And I was like, great advice, you know? Thanks. So, <laughs> or so, sure. So I, exactly. So I, I, I just remember, you know, the first two kicks I had missed right. So um, I had basically said to myself, there's no way in the world I'm going to, I'm going to bend this thing like Beckham, but it, it's, it's, it's going to play right to left. And, you know, I ended up chunking it pretty, pretty heavy. I planted super deep because my, my steps were short. I planted super deep. I chunked it. Um, and luckily enough, I did chunk it and I played it like one or two yards right because the middle rush was, was pretty serious. And it ends up going through like two guys' hands and uh, it ends up coming back to the middle. So at the end of the day, <laughs> even though it was a hook and I, I think it ended up a, a middle ball and, uh, um, and then for whatever reason, I ran the fastest 40 of my life down the, <laughs> the sideline. Hey, you it, had a nice it, convoy too, by the way. It, it was funny because I was like, I outran Willie Parker um, and a couple guys that were that were legit track stars. I think, uh, you know, uh, um, Rabbit and a couple other, you know, fast D-backs. And um, I remember kind of just dodging two cops and then I thought the helmet was going to be super, super soft. Like, you know, the ones in your yard, right? But like <laughs> Santa's up and it's just kind of blowing and you can kind of knock it over. Um, but I hit this thing with everything I had and I swear to you, it shot me completely to the other side. And <laughs> yeah, we couldn't see that portion of it. You're getting tossed. It's, it's, I got taught. I mean, I got ragdoll tossed probably 10 feet to the other side and, uh, and I, I get up and nobody's in here yet. So I start walking out and sure enough, the first person coming in is Jason Brown. So <laughs> not a small, absolutely, human, right? <laughs> no, you got, you got a, an all pro center. And this guy, I mean, he hit me so hard. I swear my legs wrapped around his waist and, uh, and then, and then it was kind of odd. Some of the big boys came in and, um, it was, uh, it was a cool ending, but, um, it definitely, it definitely comes up. Um, it comes up a good bit. Um, so not the sidebar. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to ask you not the aftermath. The, the aftermath was, uh, was great. I was more angry just at myself. I, I, I as I look back at some of the pictures, my dad always jokes around. He's like, why are you so angry? You just kicked a game winner. I was like, I was like, no, oh, I totally screwed my season up. I, I, you know, I didn't need to do that. And he's like, yeah, well, why are you so angry? And I was like, afterwards, you know, of course, Duke cuts off the hot water. So now we're like, uh, you got to walk three miles back to the to the showers back there. And, right. You know, I'm like the la last person to shower at the coaches. So you're like, great. It's cold. It's, it's not a good situation. So uh, it was good. <laughs> that is one of the, uh, the one of the epic Carolina Duke stories. I mean, there's a ton of them, but that. I laugh to this day to see you flying in that tunnel. I wish there was a camera inside that uh, inside that helmet to see you just hit it and bounce off across the wall. That would be – The helmet I was back. You didn't expect the helmet, the helmet did, to fight back. The helmet, <laughs> the helmet did fight back. And, you know, it's funny that night, you, you know, we were going out celebrating. You're kind of drinking. My neck was so mangled just because <laughs> – and everybody's like – I was like, man, I feel like I got in a car crash. But, you know, you're kind of drinking – you're kind of drinking beer out of the side of your, side of your <laughs> neck like this – for the entire night, I, I mean, and then the next day, you know, Coach Bunning, you know, obviously called me in the called me in his office, and he was like, "Now, Danny, was that uh, was that premeditated?" I was like, "No, no, 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 definitely, you know, like." <laughs> and I think uh, the, the next day, I I uh, you know, I walked into the uh, to his office with like a beat Duke shirt on or something like that, and he was like. Um, he's like, because they're asking us to pay for the helmet. I was like, oh man, I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, <sighs> it's definitely definitely a good one. That um, is um, that's pretty Duke there, because yeah, you know, I, I'm surprised that helmet. The bill wasn't like 50 grand for it since they tried to charge Carolina so much to repaint the locker room several years back. I think um, it was like I think the, the the number I heard was like five times that. So I was like, "Wow, I'm no, really sorry." Stop. Yeah, it was it was a big number. It was a it was a big number. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> I was like, "Man, my high school helmet didn't look like that." But I, then he was like, "You know, you're you're making fun of their helmets still." I was like, "Well, you know, like the, the helmet I ran out of a high high school." So, but now That's they classic. have a, now they have a pretty nice little track. It is a. I've always liked watching games over there. I've always thought yep. it was a cool place to see a football game, but folks will get on me for saying that. Um, let's talk about since Joey got got you into your Carolina 
stuff. Let's talk about the NCAA record you hold. Um, you know, 150 yarder in a game is pretty solid. You did pretty it. solid. Like, yeah. like I could get, like I could get a 10 yarder out, right? Okay. <laughs> Three and then a school record 55 yarder. I mean, did you see that coming? And have you seen anything like that since? Um, I mean, that's, it was an incredible day up in Syracuse. So it's, 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 it's a cool, really cool story for me just because I grew up about seven hours south of there. And my high school coach was like part of the whole New York state football association. And, you know, um, he was kind of like on the committee to help choose the all state team. And, um, I really, we, we ended up playing a high school kickoff classic game in there. And I, I mean, I hit a 58 yarder off the top of the upright there and I was hitting kickoffs like five rows deep in the stands. And here I am as a, a rising senior. I'm like, man, I Syracuse won't even look at me. I know these guys are up in the press <laughs> box. And so these guys didn't even give me a sniff. I mean, didn't even give me a recruiting letter. Here I am, you know, I'm in South Bend, I'm in Michigan state, Wisconsin. Um, and all these places and Syracuse kind of like our only, you know, kind of home team, um, you know, uh, really didn't even, didn't even give me a sniff from a recruiting letter or anything. So, um, and for me, all my buddies that I grew up with, they went to state schools up in New York, which are pretty wild. Um, they went to, to Cortland or Ithaca or even some guys were at Syracuse. So I had like, right above our locker room, I had probably 55 tickets. I mean, what guy, what parents are dry, going up to Syracuse from, from Chapel Hill. So I was like, I'll take all y'all's tickets. I, I want them all. So, you know, in pregame, my buddies are, they're holding each other's. If I feel like if barstool sports are around, these guys would have definitely, definitely uh, made it on, on, on a couple of videos. They're, they're hanging down and, and, you know, we're slapping them five walking out of the tunnel in pregame. So, um, so, Even some of the guys were like, who are those guys? I'm like, eh, those are, you know, those are my high school buddies. So they were, uh, they were going crazy. And uh, um, it was uh, honestly the first kick they, they took, I actually went back to the net. So the 55 yarder, sorry, 53 was the first one. Uh, I went back to the net cause I didn't think that coach Bunning was going to kick it. And then someone came over and kind of yanked me on the neck and was like, Hey, you're kicking. Everybody's out there. So I kind of ran out there it was kind of a blessing in disguise because I really didn't know how far it was um, just because I thought they were going for it. I really didn't even pay attention. I think I was ready on third down. I walked over and then, um, so the first one, I, I, I think I was just kind of, I, I definitely was caught up in the moment and just didn't, didn't even think anything of it. I probably thought it was like a 35 yarder. Um, so um, the next ball kind of going into the half, all my buddies were right there so that I could see them when I walked out and I could see them out of the corner of my eye. I'm like, oh, God, these guys are going to never live. So um, I really got into that one and kind of going into the half. Those guys were ripping their shirts off. I'm like, you guys know how cold it is outside? Like, <laughs> um, and then come back out and um, like it, it was just a, um, you know, my whole family was there. My, my, my brother at the time was like 12 or 13 and, and I'm kicking at the net and the family section for Carolina was like way up in the nosebleeds. And next thing I know, my little brother, and my cousin are like the 50 yard line where the net is. And they're like saying hello to me. I'm like, uh, you guys are, you guys are 12. Like where, 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 where's my, where's our parents. And, uh, they're like, Oh no, it's good. I'm like, how'd you guys get down here? We're like, Oh, we talked to some guys and got down there. So I'm like, basically went out, smoked a field goal for 55 run back in. I'm trying to get like my parents' attention to grab my little brother. I'm like, you know, great parents, you know, you got like a couple 11 year olds running around the stadium. So, um, it was, it was a really cool game. And then, um, really, really cool after game. Um, the head coach from Syracuse actually gave me a game ball, a Syracuse game ball and sent me a letter and said, he apologized. Uh, he apologized for never recruiting me. Um, and it wasn't even him. It wasn't even him. He just, he kind of got word of this. It was before I get interviewed and I'm getting interviewed from uh, from a Carolina reporter, and a guy comes over and says, "Here's a game ball from Syracuse. Uh, we're really impressed with you. I mean, really, really first class. It was it was pretty cool. That's very cool. Um, so, is you, you talk about being caught up in the moment? And I want to ask you this before we take a break and come back and talk about um, what you're doing now. But 
you know, do, do kickers get in the zone? Uh, is that a fair thing for a kicker? Because you see, <clears throat> you see guys that, I mean, they can't kick it straight to save their lives one minute and then the next they're on fire. Uh, talk about that a little bit and, and your approach while you were at Carolina and, and kicking for the Tar Heels. You know, I think there's, um, there's definitely, there's definitely, I've been on both sides. I've been on one side where there's doubt and that doubt creeps in and it is a, it is a tough thing to, it's a tough thing to manage mentally. Um, I think that, you know, some of the other positional players may go through it when they're playing scared or they miss a block or a coach gets after them. Um, I think for me, um, I actually always felt more comfortable out on the field than I did on, on the sidelines or in a locker room. I kind of was like, I can't wait to show off. Um, and really for me, I think going into um, my senior year, I really um, – I wanted to work out with the best athletes on the team. So I kind of hung around some of the D backs just in the, in, in the, the weight room. And uh, you know, some of the guys obviously didn't want to hang around with me, but I was like, all right, these guys are the best athletes on the team. I want to work out with these guys. It's only going to help me. So like, you know, I was just, you know, a, a snot nosed New Yorker who was like, yeah, I don't care that I'm a kicker. I'm going to work out with you. So I would try to work out with Dexter and, and those guys and, you know, uh, they just had swagger about themselves. And that's just kind of the way that I took it. I just approached it like that. Um, and I think, um, you know, obviously maybe some of that is just kind of growing up where I did and, and so forth. But um, I think that is very easy to get into a zone and be zoned in and, and then also be zoned out where, you know, a coach is talking to you and you don't even know what he's saying. Um, but I think a lot of that has to do with confidence and, um, a lot of it has to be prepared. Uh, most guys are nervous. Just, I, I personally think because, um, they're not, a, they're not prepared anxiety. That's kind of, you know, kind of natural nerves that I think that happens. And, um, you know, it's tough. I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't on, on both sides of that. And I think it, it obviously helps me out now as a coach going, all right, this is how I should have approached that. Um, and, um, you know, it definitely helps me out now as, as a coach in, in my, in my post career. Um, Let's talk about that I, after the break. Let me uh, hold that thought. Let me get this Johnny t-shirt break in because they're our sponsors and they, they help us out on these podcasts. So they're to our listeners and subscribers. You need to check out Johnny t-shirt, Johnny t-shirt.com <clears throat> visit them on Franklin street. They're open They'll You can go in and shop there. Uh, they can bring it to your curbside or they can bring it to your door if you order on johnnytshirt.com. And 10% off if you're Inside Carolina Premium subscriber. Take another short break. Let the national guys pay the bills. We'll be right back on the Inside Carolina kicking it in the 40 Club. I'm Tommy Ashley. That's Joey Powell. This is Dan Orner. We'll be right back. All right, we're back with the 40 Club kicking it in the 40 Club. Dan Orner here. And I, start, I cut you off there a little bit, and I apologize for that. But I wanted to ask um, another, like, deep question for kickers because we don't get to talk to kickers that much. And I know when you and I talked on the phone and I told you um, we talked about this podcast and a buddy of mine, you're coaching his son, um, and he says he's learned so much, the mental aspect of the game from you and from your guys there. My question is this, and I'll start off lighthearted, and I'll let Joey get deep. What's the worst thing somebody can say to a kicker? I, I was I, I I feel like at a game, I feel like if you're hearing guys across from you on the line, then you're probably not in the zone, um, and maybe this is not the right skill set for you. Um, unfortunately, I, I, I guess my mindset is a little bit different. I, I always try to coach my guys to be – um, um, growing up where I did, um, obviously, um, in New York, there's a lot of firefighters and I grew up a lot of families that were affected by 9-11. So I always kind of had the mindset and I was at Carolina when 9-11 happened. Um, I always kind of viewed myself as a mindset and I lost some really good, um, you know, friends, dads that, um, that were, uh, unfortunately, uh, taken down in its hours, um, as firefighters. And I think the thing that really changed my mindset was when I really thought about that as a kicker, not just as a human being, but, um, you know, 
obviously the towers were going down and most of these firefighters were sprinting towards the opportunity to run up the steps to save somebody's life. Now, I wish I was that brave. If a, if a, a hundred story tower was going down, I'm probably sprinting the other way. Uh, but these guys were sprinting towards that opportunity. And I really kind of, uh, if I go speak at a, a college or NFL team and they're like, what's the characteristic? Or even during COVID, we would have these, you know, 50 coach Zoom meetings. And they're, the number one question I would get asked is, what's the trait you look for as a kicker? And I would say, you want them to be a New York City firefighter. And they'd be like, what do you mean? And I would always say, like, um, these guys are running, sprinting up the steps in gear. They're probably not going to make it. But they are so looking forward to that opportunity to run in that burning building. Um, and one of my best friends that I grew up with, he ends up um, – he ends up, um, he works at Harlem for the Hudson, um, probably one of the notor most notorious, dangerous um, um, FDNY spots just because of all the five bell fire alarms. And I said to him, I said, Sean, why do you want to, why do you want to go in such a bad area? He's like, this is where all the action is. This is where the best fires are. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to compete against the best people? And it made so much sense for me from then on that I was like, I should be running up to my coach, smack him and go and kick it. I hope that he yells me to get the F off the field as a kicker because I have that much confidence to go out there and, and drain this field goal. And that's kind of the, the mentality that I breed into my guys. If you're walking towards your net, you're probably not the right guy. You should, be go you should be running on the field and the head coach should be yelling his brains out to get you off the field. Um, so... Um, you know, obviously, there's there's two sides to that coin too. Obviously, with what you see in um, in the playoffs over the last couple of years, um, and I can't tell you how many times I go to games and I hear people, oh, I I could have made that, you know, 25 yarder. <laughs> you know, Twitter did a, a great thing. You know, um, during the college playoffs and the Super Bowl with 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 picking some guys that were hating on Twitter and stuff like that. <laughs> um, the easiest way I always explain to guys is like, what do you, I always ask people like, what do you do for a living? And people are like, Oh, I, you know, I'm a banker. I'm in finance. I'm like, all right, well you picture you typing an algorithm on a computer and a six foot seven guy that only has aspirations of burying you is chasing you. Why you're typing on a computer, how are you going to do your job? And they were like, well, you know, that's not realistic. I'm like, yeah, well, that's what you'd have to go through if you want to, you know, be one of the, you know, the, the 0.08% in the world. Right. Um, so, I mean, it, it comes up a lot. And I think a lot of guys, um, you know, definitely um, are from the school thought, Oh, I definitely could have made that. And I, you know, I always ask them like, what, where did they, where did they play? And they would always be like, well, I played high school football. And I'm like, I think that's no cut. Um, <laughs> just, just, just to kind of lighten up the situation. But, uh, um, but it's, 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 it's definitely a tough mental game. And I think guys are a lot more proactive now to, to seek out help um, to strengthen their brains as a, as a weapon. So let me ask you this. I love the perspective and I love the way that you were able to, to spin something as, as emotional and as deep as uh, you kind of a, a 9-11 firefighters perspective. I, I love that. Um, how do you take a guy and make sure that he sees making a or taking a game winning kick is an opportunity but then also you know one of your favorite lines is is to never make the situation bigger than it is right so how do you get a guy who sees that opportunity but then how do you also train him so that he doesn't make the situation bigger than it really is yeah you know i definitely stole that from my from my dad i'm not going to take credit for that it's, it's hilarious so the first ever the first ever college game that I saw, I played in. I never got to wow. go to a college game. The first ever NFL game that I went to, I played in. So for me, when I got to Michigan State, I'm like, y'all want me to drill 50 yarders? This is, this is, all right, that's what I'm supposed to do. Right. <laughs> um, so for me, I never really did make the situation. It's almost when guys know how big the situation is that they make it too big. Um, and that's why you see some of these vets play into their thirties because one, their bank account set. So they're like, worst case scenario, I'm going to go, you know, take pictures in the morning of surfers in Wilmington. And, uh, <laughs> and then two, um, you know, some of these guys just get to a sense of, of, you know, they've already achieved most of the goals in their life. So 
um, you know, that, that fear never creeps in. So um, it's tough. It is definitely the, the most tough thing to acclimate somebody to, especially as a kicker. Um, I've had guys that I was like, man, this guy is, you know, definitely a guy that, that is bulletproof um, and get into certain situations. And I would say just like a, a, any, everybody has a breaking point. And, um, you know, the, the, the pressure is, is insanely high at, at, at any position level. And I think that um, a certain guys thrive in those situations. The, the difference obviously is a kicker is we only have you know, two or three shots versus, you know, a, a wide receiver. If he drops a ball, he right. may have, you know, eight to 10 touches in a game or something like that. So, so um, two parter for you. And the first one, I'd love to know, who was somebody that you've worked with that the first time you saw him kick or the first time you talked to him, you knew, okay, this guy is nails. And then the second part, I'd love to hear somebody that you've worked with that you feel like you made the biggest impact on or the biggest improvement on from a coach's perspective. That's tough. That's a good one. Um, so I've been coaching now for 15 years. Uh, it's, it's um, so um, it's been an interesting uh, it's kind of an acorn to an oak tree. Um, when I was in college, I actually was of the mindset that um, I wanted to have someone awesome kind of replace me. So I started coaching when I was in, in, at UNC. Um, Connor would come up. Um, he and I met each other at a camp. Um, and I actually, it's a funny story. Like he and I are super close. Um, one of my best friends now. And uh, when I met Connor at a camp, I was kind of on the lower field with some of the um, some of the lower guys and he was a freshman at the time. And I was like, yeah, you're just not good enough to go to the top guys. And so he ends up basically saying like, F you Dan, and <laughs> I'm going to show you. And he ends up, he ends up going ahead as like a freshman and beating all the kids at the camp and went at the camp. Um, I think it was like Virginia tech at the time. Um, and his dad ends up basically coming up to me and saying like, I really want you to coach my son. And I'm like, he just, he just basically cursed me out. Like, I don't know if this is a good fit. So Tom was like, no, I think it's a great fit. And um, he's like, you're super intense. He's super intense. And um, so Connor would come up like basically on Sundays after we had training table, he and I would just start. Um, I started training him um, on some of the intramural fields and stuff like that. And I basically was like, um, this is something his dad basically was like, this is something you need to do. You need to get serious about this. You have a gift. Um, and, um, which is funny because my dad always said that I was like a terrible speaker and he would always video camera at home <laughs> and count, count how many times I said, um, and yeah. And, and, and sure enough, he's like, someday you're going to, you're going to, you're going to talk to some people that actually matter. And, and I was like, as a you know 15 year old kid, I'm like mortified, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, we, we would have like all these like fake, fake calls and stuff like that. Similarly calls it's it's hilarious. It's like what they do in the corporate world now. So, um, but I, th I think one of the guys, one of the first guys that I met um, was Pinion. I've, I've, I've coached Pinion, Bradley Pinion, um, since I was Super, Super Bowl champion, Bradley Pinion. Yes. Su Super Bowl champion, Bradley Pinion, since he was 12. Um, and the first time that I trained him, um, it's funny. I forgot about this story until um, like two years ago. Um, first time I trained him, I basically was of the mindset of like, of just extreme mastery, like mastery to skill, mastery, any drill that you have at the time, I did not let him kick a ball for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And um, he just basically, he went with everything I did. He got in the car and his dad's the one who told me this story. I forgot it. This is, this is a long time. It was like <laughs> le leading up to the Super Bowl. And he goes, you know why we, we stuck with you? And I said, no, he said that day that, that, that you didn't let Bradley kick a ball. I knew that, this would eventually pay off from a for, form and technical standpoint. Mm. And uh, I, I had to, of course, ask an opinion. And he's like, dude, I hated that. I can't believe you did that to me. We, <laughs> and I was like, oh, we're going to start doing this now after the Super Bowl. And he was like, no, come on. So it was, uh, it was, it was great. Um, you know, there, there's been a bunch of kids that, um, you know, uh, come from tough backgrounds um, and kids that were, um, one didn't have cleats, didn't have, um, Wow. And, and I think um, a lot of times I was fortunate at the time to have a kind of a deal with Nike. So I would be able to get some kids, some cleats and make sure they have cleats and make sure they have footballs and stuff like that. There's a, there's a lot of things behind the scenes um, to me that really mean the most important. This is like a extended part of my family. That's powerful. Um, a lot of people. Um, so I've actually been in the, 
this was basically my kind of my side thing. I was in, in commercial insurance uh, for the last 15 years at Wells Fargo um, and actually still do some commercial insurance. Um, so really, you know, kind of my, my day job, I would get up super early in the morning, uh, work out, go to work. Um, I'd go out sometimes at lunch um, and then with guys start training. And then um, I go out after work to like nine, 10 o'clock and train guys. And then it kind of just kind of grew. Um, so I was in a position financially just from, you know, having a, a really successful job and in the financial world where I was, you know, basically, you know, helping out a lot of kids that, that I can't tell you how many times guys would, would, I don't know if I would have had this much pride where kids would text me or email and say, coach, listen, times are really tough. I don't think I can afford training with you. Um, and I would say, you know, same thing I said today, I, I, it takes a lot of pride for a 14 or 15 get year old kid to do that. Um, so I would just say, you know, training's money's never going to come between us training and me changing your life. And I still do that today. Um, and there's, it, it takes some special kids to say that. I know I couldn't, couldn't have said something like that. Um, you know, guys need footballs and stuff like that. I, I, I try to take care of, take care of kids as much as possible. I, I genuinely feel like now I have the ability to, to really change, change kids' lives. And I, and, you know, I heard this story from Greg Popovich. He still replies to all the letters and emails and texts. Um, and I've been around family members. I'm like, I can't believe you're replying to that text or email. That's just, you know, another crazy parent. I'm like, I, this is, this is what I work so hard for to get in a position where, you know, I used to beg college coaches to, to listen to what I had to say about my kickers. And now I set up Zoom calls with 20 of them and they go, all right, let's go through your pipeline. And we want to make sure oh, at four years out, who do you have? Your guy's going to replace this guy. All right. All right. Um, what do you think about um, uh, this guy across the country? So um, I've always felt like if I got in a position where I was able to change, you know, people's lives that one, I would answer and take every phone call. Um, and it, and that, it, it definitely adds up. So um I don't know if there's a specific kid that I feel like I've, um, you know, helped the most. I, I think a lot of these guys, obviously, um, I was thinking about this the other day. I, I feel like a lot of these guys have pushed me to become a better coach. Um, and um, it's a neat situation. I, I, this past year was the first year um, I had to go in. It's for whatever reason, a bunch of the colleges that I work with don't never ask me for a resume. It was just word of mouth. Hey, you got to use this guy. The NFL team that I was going to, to, to speak with, they're like, this is a full, um, this is a full gig. Like you got to come with a resume. So I sat down first time in my life, 15 years into coaching and <laughs> created, created my resume. And when I look back, it was the first time I actually had to take a breath and just kind of look at things. And, um, you know, we have 52 active division one kickers and punters. Like I feel like we pretty much That's control awesome. half of the fourth down on any Saturday in across the entire country. So um, it, it's, and that's just on the division one level power five conference. Um, so it's, um, it, it's definitely an acorn to Oak tree. And it's, it's funny because people are always like, so what do you, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a kitten coach. And they're like, Oh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's real cool. That's cute. You know, kind of deal. And um, I, I sat down next to a lady on the plane and, and kind of piggybacking what you guys said um, a lot of times, um, this lady um, was sitting next to me on a plane and she's like, what do you do? And I'm like, I feel like I'm a, um, you know, a psychologist. I'm, I'm a dad to some of these kids. I'm a motivator. I'm a mentor. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of these guys, you know, not only do I hold them accountable, they hold me accountable to go. Um, there's definitely some days where, um, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, coaching it definitely kickers and punters is like, it's like being a swing coach and um, it's a lot of pressure on Saturdays. It's, it's a stressful day because, you know, guys were like, Oh, you get to go to this game. I'm like, I, I'm not sitting in enjoying the game. I this I'm having a vested interest only on fourth down. So it's, yeah. uh, it, it's definitely tough. You're like a parent with 52 sons playing on yeah. every given Saturday. Yeah. 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 So let me ask, and I know uh, we're pushing time and I know you're busy, but I wanted to sort of ask you the um, last couple of questions. <clears throat> People are always curious about kicker and punter recruiting and you're heavily involved in that. How, 
tell us, walk us through that because you explained yourself. Syracuse didn't sniff you. You're right, you know, virtually around the corner to them. You've got all these other colleges interested. How, how difficult is it for kickers and, and punters to be recruited and, and get good scholarship offers? Um, and how do you facilitate that process for them? Yeah, so it's 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 an ever evolving, uh, definitely ever evolving process, especially during COVID. You know, during COVID, it was almost like the 1990s again, mm-hmm. where if you could put together a good tape, and um, you know you had a good editor, and you waited for the right wins, you could put together a pretty dang good tape, and you probably could fool some college coaches. There's some college coaches that I've had conversation with to go. I definitely, I definitely got got, and, and by that I mean you know kind of go out and make a supplemental tape. Um, but, but now, you know, um, during COVID obviously it was, it was unique, um, where they were kind of leaning on guys like myself to, to help create some supplemental tapes, um, kicking as compared to other positions, you know, typically really doesn't start heavy until your junior year. Um, and then obviously going into your senior year, um, at the specific universities is, is pretty much what I always tell folks is money best spent. Um, you know, for, for someone like myself, there's a lot of combines, uh, ranking camps, star camps out there. Um, I really don't do any of that stuff. Um, I, I really, um, really want to have a relationship with my kids. I want to know what their parents do. Um, I want to know um, kind of what motivates them. And it really helps me have a backstory with the coaches. Um, and I think that um, I, I think that why some of the college partners trust me is that I try to give them a finished product. Um, and, you know, I, I think fortunately, um, a lot of the college coaches, you know, they know where they're strong at and they know where they're weak at. And I think that that obviously makes someone like myself valuable um, as a um, as a as a key partner. But um, the recruiting really starts heavily going into, you know, your junior year, heavily into your senior year. So this summer, you know, the guys who are 22 guys are are running and gunning. Um, and this this month it's all in the month of June. So. Um, you're kind of a slave to when the camps are, you're getting on, you know, planes or driving. Uh, most of my guys get to 12 to 15 camps. And, uh, you know, obviously if you grew up in a, in a blue collar family, like myself, that was kind of your vacation, you know, going to Penn state and, um, or, you know, we, I remember we went out to Notre Dame, the, the special teams assistant at Notre Dame was urban Meyer. And, uh, he's going, damn, what's your longest field goal? And I'm like talking to him, like you and I are talking, not like, yes, sir. You know, <laughs> and cool. uh, now, you, um, but it's changed a ton. And I think that, um, you know, I always kind of envision it like buying a car. Um, a lot of highlight tapes look really good. Your car always looks good online. They have the right lighting and so forth on, on Instagram or so forth. And then, you know, you're still going to go down to the dealership and press the gas and see, um, Obviously, if there's any scratches, any imperfections, that engine turnover, and, and the same thing with kickers. Um, and I think for me, um, you know, one of the big things that I try to do is make sure that the guys are a right fit for each of the schools. If, a, um, you know, a Chapel Hill calls me and they say, this is what we're looking for, I make sure that, you know, uh, um, I make sure they have, you know, the, firstly, the guys that are local. Um, and it's neat now, you know, um, you know, obviously a lot of the schools are local in the ACC. We have guys at, so um, the guys get to, to grow up kicking with each other. Um, so for me, every year I have about 20 guys that um, kind of kind of like what we would call kind of our special ops group, kind of the top group of guys. And, you know, every year we kind of hunt getting ready, almost like, you know, June's our Olympics. So um, it takes a lot of phone calls, a lot of time with coaches sitting down watching film. Um but I think the best thing that helps me is that, you know, once over the last, um, you know, 10 years where my guys have gone in and, and produced, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much the best way um, for me because the coaches, I'm going to be their first call because um, they're like, all right, um, you know, Connor Barth just broke all of your records. Who are you going to get to replace? Well, simple Casey Barth. We've been grooming him for four, you know, for four years. All right. Casey is, is rolling out who's who's the next guy and I think um you know the analytics are there now at least for me um as a coach I can kind of look at a kid in ninth grade and say all right these four guys um are going to be definitely full scholarship guys um and it just kind of allows me to from an analytical standpoint 
kind of prove to the coaches reasons why. Um, the beauty of being a kicker and a punter, it's different than a running back. If you a 50 yarder in New York is a 50 yarder in North Carolina, 50 yarder in Division One is a 50 yarder in Division Three. It's not like having a sad defense or a sad offense or um, you know something like that. And same thing with punting, it's a unique thing where the numbers the numbers don't lie. And um, you know, there's some states obviously where there's some excessive wind and. You know, you got to make sure you you educate coaches, you know, about wind. And, you know, I watch a lot of highlight tapes with coaches and point things out. Well, you know what? He only kicks off one way. You know, have you noticed the the, the flag in the back right side is, is straight out to the side? My flag at my house doesn't even do that. Um, do you notice that the cheerleaders down at the bottom of the, the screen, their hair is to the side? I, I, I'm on social media. That's definitely not a style that's going on right now. So, um <laughs> And a lot of times, you know, even as an as an advocate, coaches will send me video and say, hey, can you tell me your honest thoughts about this kid? And, and a lot of times those guys aren't mine. Um, but these are buddies of mine that are coaching and they're going, listen, my my mortgage relies on this and I need your help. So that's where I really feel like I'm a true partner for some of these guys, because, um, you know, uh, year in, year out, they're 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 calling me back. So it's 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 cool. Last question, Dan, and this is Dan Orner of DanOrnerKicking.com. You need to check it out. Cool website. Great. Uh, you got the schedule up there, too, and it is quite busy here in June. Uh, what do you think about Mac Brown and what he's done with this Carolina squad going into what should be a special 2021? So I'm a, I'm, I'm really a huge, huge fan of Coach Brown, and I think, um, you know, I, I think there was a number of years. Um, I, I don't want to speak – um, out of tongue, but I probably had gone to more. Uh, I had been to other ACC games before I would go to a Carolina game just because of uh, things were happening within the, um, the school. But, you know, Coach Brown um, invited a ton of us uh, alumni slash coaches back. And, you know, I obviously had never met him. And first thing he does, he, he knows, you know, I don't even know if he knew who I was supposed to be there, but he knew exactly who I was where I went to high school. Um, wow. I, I think the little things like that, that, that just go a long way. And, and it's just, it's just first class top to bottom. And uh, the, the assistant coaches um, uh, that are there now have open arms to me and say, Dan, listen, you're a part of our family. I, I want, I want your help. Um, it, it's just a, it's a breath of fresh air, the stuff that's going on right now. And I know a lot of the, the players, um, the ex players, um, the guys that I know, guys who have contributed way more than I have, um, really appreciate that. Um, there's some awesome alumni that have kind of brought a lot of the guys together, um, like Brian Chacos. He's done an amazing job of kind of. There's a good bit of guys in Charlotte that um, that are getting together. We were getting together a good bit, you know, pre-COVID, and it was just great to meet, um, you know, you know, guys from the past and network. I mean, the networking. Um, I, I tell the story all the time when I got done playing, um, and my career in the NFL was a five minutes of fame with, with, uh, with the Vikings, you know, the Gail Bomars and the Andy Dinkins and the Rick Steinbrenners are the people that got me 50 interviews in Charlotte. I mean, I went on 50 interviews and I am indebted to those guys. If they told me they need my help, I would be there in two seconds. And, um, what they're saying is a 40 year decision, uh, a four year decision as a 40 year decision is the truth. I mean, I can't tell you how many times uh, in my 15 career at the bank where I walked into a meeting and said, Hey, I'm so-and-so. And, -so, and I, I went to, or even meeting with clients. Um, and I was a, a Chapel Hill grad, how far that goes. Um, so for myself, um, without a doubt, I would not be in the situation I am um, from a coaching standpoint. And then also from a, a, just a, a job networking standpoint. And, um, I think that, uh, it's definitely one of my favorite places to go. I, 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 uh, every summer I selfishly sneak up to Chapel Hill when nobody's there. And I, I run the, I run the stadium steps. And I just kind of walk around the field just because, uh, it's definitely a place where all my dreams came true as a, as a kid who wants to, to be a division one football player. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of guys that leave schools that have a bad taste in the mouth, that the school got the most out of them. And I always look at, to my guys and I'm like, you need to, to get the most out of the school. And a place like Chapel Hill, 
is 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 a fountain of of endless opportunities and um so i try to educate guys all the time of how to network you know have coffee with guys and so forth so um, i extend to anybody anybody who wants to um to sit down with me and, and hear how i was successful and so forth and um, i try to do that with the, with the kickers that, that i you know i always tell them like football is gonna end it's gonna end for all of us and um, you gotta have a postgraduate plan um, so I sit down with a good group of my guys that, that unfortunately don't make it in the NFL. There's only 32 jobs. And um, um, so for myself, you know, as I'm getting guys ready for pro days, I'm also getting them ready to say, all right, what's, what's your backup plan? All right. I, I want to be in private equity. Have you talked to 10 private equity people? Well, no. So, um, but again, without the people at Chapel Hill, undoubtedly I would not be in this, the, the, the standpoint I am today. So the, Again, the, the, the Gail Bomars and, and the Coach Bunnings and the, the Andy Dinkins and the Rick Steinbreckers, those are the guys that I asked for help. And um, when I got done playing the NFL, and those guys were there to give me the shirts off their backs. So uh, I don't hear very many stories like that from, um, from other counterparts that I work with on a regular basis. Man. It's a great commercial for the show, man. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say, you know, it, we talked about the 40 Club. Well, there it is. That That's what it all is, is all about here. I'm on the Inside Carolina podcast, the 40 Club. Um, bonus question. If I'm drafting prime kickers in their prime, am I going Orner, Connor, or Casey? I I think Connor's the, the – I personally think Connor is the is the greatest Carolina kicker. Um, he obviously Casey has a ton of records. Casey's a, uh, he is a legend. Um, Nick Weiler is a great Carolina kicker. Jeff Reed's a great kind of, but Connor Barth is, is the guy. He's definitely the, he's definitely the, I mean, the, the game winner, obviously basically put Carolina back on the map. I was sitting with his parents yeah. in that game. And I think his dad, like, I, I felt like I got in a car crash. He's just, Tom's just shaking. Me. Can you have? And, uh, you know, I think, I think for me, it's, is as a coach, it's a completely different high than playing. Um, I can't even imagine as a parent, I don't have kids, but um, it is a completely different high getting to see people that you had directly affected um, their lives, um, see them living out their dreams and, and flourishing. Um, You know, I have uh, seven guys in the NFL and um, some of those guys, um, we're dro- barely making it to workouts. And, and at one point, um, the Broncos punter that I have Sam Martin, you know, he's the second highest paid punter in the NFL at 15 million bucks. So, um, it's, uh, it, it, everything comes full circle from, 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 from nowhere to somewhere. So, um, it's pretty cool that I, that, that it's, it's, it's come from an acorn to an oak tree like this. Um, and, um, you know, I tell kids all the time, like after um, I was I was fortunate enough to go on the field after the Super Bowl um, and we we're running on the field. And I'm, I swear I'm trying not to be starstruck. And I've been on a bunch of cool fields. But as soon as I hit the, the Super Bowl field, I felt like I was floating. I had opinion gives me hell about this all the time. I have one job. He goes, I want you to take a picture of my wife jumping in in my arms. And I seriously, as soon as I went out on the field, I just, I just froze. So, um, of course I <laughs> the missed moment that got picture. Too big for you, Dan, the moment yeah, was too big for definitely. you. <laughs> so, uh, and he said to me, can you believe it? Eight years ago, we were kicking on a dirt field in the middle of Charlotte and they were kicking us off the field because they said we were just a bunch of stupid kickers. And here we are holding the Lombardi trophy on the greatest field ever. Um, and, and, and to that point, when he said that to me, I was just, I was like blown away. And uh, I was the last person to leave the field during the Super Bowl this past year. So everybody left the field and I was like, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. I felt like Wolf of Wall Street. I'm like, I'm not leaving. So uh, <laughs> I'm going up on the stage. I'm FaceTiming my parents. And one of the sergeants comes over to me and he goes, son. And I said, listen, one of my guys just won the Super Bowl. Um, he said, you basically, you don't got to go home, but you gotta, you gotta get out of here. I said, I want to take one more picture. So I wanted a snow angel that the emblem. So he, here, the sergeant is taking pictures and, um, and so I'm literally, they're shutting down the lights. I'm the last person in the stadium. And, and, uh, he goes, let me give you a ride back to your car. So we end up going around with the police lights 
and he and I just hit it off and, um, and he ends up helping me pick up Pinion's family and we're, we're, we're driving to the, the park and ride. So it was, uh, you know, I tell the kids that I see this past week, I said eight years ago, he was standing right where you were and now he is a Super Bowl champ. So for the young guys, it's super relevant and it's, it's, it's also motivating as well. Well, for a guy that came to Chapel Hill and saw the university uh, help him, and he helped the university also in, in a lot of ways, uh, for a guy like yourself that was able to turn something that you loved into now a very, very, you know, booming career, uh, touching so many other lives and helping to repay what you learned and pay it forward for some others. Uh, love the story, love that you've been able to have such a large amount of success with it and have been able to kind of share that success with with the next few generations. But Dan Orner, we appreciate you joining us here on the 40 Club. Again, you knocked out of the park. You know, it's not a four-year decision. It's a 40-year decision. And uh, you were absolutely a great guest for all those reasons. So we appreciate you joining us here on InsideCarolina.com. For Tommy Ashley, for Dan Orner, who kicked it with us tonight in the 40 Club, I'm Joey Powell. Check us out next time on the next edition of an InsideCarolina.com podcast. We'll talk to you down the road. Yeah, and, and for the record, we'll have Casey and Connor next week. We'll we're see gonna, I, should, I should call it. I should call it and ask some questions. About, yeah, you about should trade it, trade in those guys. That'd be great. The, yeah, give, we're us going to, uh, give, us, give us the off the record questions that we should be asking. Yeah, we'll have a surprise guest, man. You've been great. I appreciate it. Uh, props to Brian for hooking us together and, and getting us on this show. But yeah, you nailed yes, it. Yes, sir. Nailed Thank you guys. Five yarder into the wind. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Thanks, see you, buddy.